Hello everyone, you're about to see my review of the Starfinder Galaxy Exploration Manual. Uh, this is a book I was really looking forward to and I had a lot of fun actually recording the review. However, I got a little bit ahead of myself or a little bit forgetful. I'm trying to still get back into the swing of, uh, of doing videos again here. Uh, but I just want to, you know, make it, make it fully aware uh, that this was a review copy that was sent to me by Paizo for the purposes of reviewing the uh, the Starfinder Galaxy Exploration Manual. Um, they're not, you know, paying for the, the review. They're not influencing it. They're not, you know, scripting it or reviewing the video before it goes live. Uh, the opinions that I express in this video are 100% completely and totally my own. Uh, but they did send this book out to me and I wanted to make sure that that was very clear and I just sort of um, got caught up in what I was doing and completely forgot to mention it in the review itself. So I just wanted to tack this on at the very beginning. Uh, thank you guys, hope you understand <laughs> and uh, hope you enjoy the review of the Starfinder Galaxy Exploration Manual. <laughs> Hello YouTube, Dave here again. Today I'm going to be reviewing the Starfinder Galaxy Exploration Manual. So this is a book that I was really looking forward to as soon as I saw it was announced. Uh, I'm not going to be doing a full flip through in this video. I will do one of those uh, probably in the next you know few days after this goes out. Uh, but I really wanted to get uh, the, the review out first uh, because this book, spoiler alert, uh, I think this book is absolutely awesome. Uh, so what this is, is it's kind of a campaign setting sort of book for uh, the uh, the vast, which is like this large, unexplored or or barely explored region of space that's sort of like outside of the the packed worlds and outside of like the near space system with the Viscarium and some of the other locations. So this is basically uh, your opportunity to create your whole like you know universe galaxy uh, outside of the the main established areas, which is something like I said I was looking really really forward to. Uh, on the back here, we see that the price is $39.99 US. Uh, the Canadian retail price, I think, is about $10, 5 to $10 more than that. And uh, on the back here, it says that it gives you a wealth of player character options, from detailed background generation to exploration-themed rules for every class, uh, plus creature companions, equipment, feats, spells, and so on. A system for quickly generating and fleshing out the uh, infinite worlds, of your own design, uh, from physical attributes to, and biome-specific details to a multitude of cultural aspects and adventure hooks, uh, advice and tools to help game masters run trailblazing exploration-based sandbox games in a limitless galaxy, uh, toolboxes for enriching any science fiction setting from starships and treasure to settlements and NPCs. Uh, so yeah, this book um, delivers a lot of really uh, great stuff here. So one of the first things that I want to talk about really quickly is the character background section uh, Because it's awesome. The, the background gives you a series of tables that you can either roll on if you want to do random generation Or some ideas that you can sort of pick from if you want to uh, choose your stuff more deliberately uh, But what you actually have is like where you come from uh, what caused you to sort of become like transition from just an inhabitant of the world or the, the location that you grew up to or grew up in to becoming a uh, an adventurer player character basically um and uh, like who's you know a major person could be from your background be it you know friendly or um maybe antagonistic so it gives you all kinds of stuff here so like i said we got the uh, the charts and yeah, it's just awesome. <laughs> I I I'm, I love charts. So when you get to roll on stuff like this, uh, it's always great. So what they give you is, I'll just read like one of the examples here. Uh, so one of them uh, says here, uh, you grew up in an in uh, educational institute or specialized training program. It might have been localized, such as in a monastery school or military base, or it might have been a vast university city. So basically, they give you sort of a, a very like brief description of the kind of place that you grew up in and then examples of what it could be that can help you 
develop your background. So for example, you could say that um, you basically grew up in like a, uh, a military base and were trained from a young age to be like the soldier that you ended up becoming. So that's really cool. Uh, the major events, again, it gives you uh, the, sort of the same thing, gives you an idea and then some you know examples that you can draw from. Uh, so one of the, the one I like here <laughs> is actually the second one. It says, uh, you were once an animal, but somehow you gained uh, sapience, whether through the power of technology, magic, or divine will. Uh, you've adapted to society well, uh, but retained some animalistic behaviors. So, um, you know, my my soldier character could have been like part of a, like a government experiment on, you know, animals and transforming them, making them anthropomorphic and stuff like that. Because there's a lot of things that you can do uh, with that in, uh, in Starfinder. Uh, influential person. Again, this is someone that would be personally significant to you in your background, either for, for good reasons or bad reasons. Uh, so like one of them here says, a confidant that knows your secrets and has your full trust. They may be a parent, sibling, lover, best friend, or therapist. If you wrong them, they could become a terrifying enemy. So again, just some awesome stuff there. I absolutely love the other uh, chart. Uh, the last one is actually for party relationships. So uh, if you wanted to, either the game master might just roll on this once for the entire party and let them know how they know each other. Uh, so, for example, uh, you may have all been arrested or falsely accused of the same crime. You might have um, you might have proven your innocence together, served time in prison, or been pardoned uh, but live with a tarnished reputation. Uh, you might hold a grudge against those who accused or condemned you. So, um, you can do that for the party as a whole, or you could actually have the players roll um, to see how they know each other. So, uh, I think that's just a really cool, uh, concept as well to have. Uh, then we got some player character, um, you know, options, some new things that we can, uh, that the player character classes can have. Uh, and it, it covers all of the classes from the core rulebook, as well as the character operations manual, like the, the biohacker, uh, the vanguard and the, um, um, was it the witch warper? Uh, so a lot of these are essentially abilities that are designed around um, different environments or interacting with different um, cultures or things like that. My favorite one uh, is actually the mechanics because they have uh, an ability called Stranded Inventions as well as Stranded Innovations. And what that means is that if you're stranded even on a planet that is like technologically way behind, um, you can scavenge raw materials uh, in order to create a jerry-rigged technological item that, you know, doesn't work obviously as frequently or maybe even as reliably as a standard version, but it's something that you could, that you could work with, right? And uh, it just really makes me want, if someone had this as an ability, I would absolutely try to run uh, a scenario where they are like, they crash land on a, on a technologically, you know, devoid planet and they have to, uh, to jerry-rig some stuff. It kind of reminds me of like the, the Rick and Morty when they went into the microverse battery, um, you know, that sort of thing. Just, you know, having to create technology with what, you know, limited options you have available. So I really, really love that. And you've got other character class options for things like being able to traverse through different types of environment. Like you can spend just a little bit of time getting familiar with them and then you can move through them without worrying about, you know, um, difficult terrain slowing you down or things like that. So there's just a lot of really cool uh, abilities that they add there as well. Uh, there's all kinds of, you know, equipment and stuff added as well. Um, you know, some great stuff there, but my, the, the, the bread and butter, the meat and potatoes of this book is the infinite world section. Uh, so like I said, this is sort of a campaign setting book, but it's a campaign setting book where you, the game master are creating that campaign setting. Uh, the vast is called that for a reason. It's not, you know, a small, narrow, defined region of space, like the packed world system, the Viscarium, or even what we consider to be near space which is heavily charted, explored, and well-known for traveling, uh, the vast is basically just going out and seeing what's out there. Um, so with this system that they have here, uh, it gives you the ability to create star systems, planets, um, the environments on the planets, and then sort of like populate it with, you know, what character or what kind of creatures might be there, uh, as well as like their magic or technological uh, levels, uh, if they're religious or not, and what their accord is. Accord is basically how easy they are to interact with in terms of like diplomacy. So a high accord, um, the DCs to, you know, do like diplomacy or things like that are 
uh, are lower. Uh, if it's uh, like a medium accord, it's uh, basically just standard straight across the board, normal DCs. And if it's low accord, uh, you may be dealing with a mild to moderate or even extremely xenophobic race or planet or culture. Um, where, you know, it's going to be much more difficult, so it increases the uh, the DCs. Uh, so it gives you sort of some ideas here as to what you can sort of uh, use. It gives you, like, the step-by-steps, uh, but then we get into the, like, the different biomes and stuff like that as well. So uh, one of the first things, I think I actually skipped over it uh, with the exploration system, because I, I think the equipment actually came after that. Uh, but with the exploration system, so we'll just skip back to that for a second. Uh, so what we actually have is some steps, some activities, some, you know, skill checks that you need to make in order to identify where a, a potential star system might be. And once you locate a star um, and travel sort of into its system, um, you know, the tools that you'll need in order to actually locate planets. Because, you know, planet, you know, even solar systems, there's huge distances in between. So you may not recognize uh, a planet um, right off the bat with your, your first sensor scan. So it gives you uh, what you have to roll, the different downtime activities that you have to take um, to locate a galactic destination uh, based off of uh, like gravimetric distortions and stuff like that, which is always kind of cool. Or gravity wells, I guess is what they call it. Uh, and then mapping a star system so your science officer um, can you know spend time uh, creating a map of the star system based on the gravity well readings that they found uh, and where it's most likely that they're going to have planets, which is really cool. And then uh, when you get to the planets, uh, you can scan them and explore them from orbit, or you can do world exploration. And there's even some hexploration stuff here. And at the back of the book, there's actually just a little tiny uh, hex map thing that you can use. Uh, but hex crawls are always, in my opinion, a ton of fun to do. And it ties into, you know, what I would want to do with this book to begin with. And we'll talk sort of a little bit more about that uh, towards the end. But you can explore and sort of create, you know, these maps as you go using the exploration, um, using the exploration activities. Uh, as for the worlds themselves, like I said, there's all kinds of stuff that you can populate them with. Uh, first thing you have to determine is what kind of object it is. If it's a terrestrial planet like Earth, uh, a gas giant like, you know, uh, Saturn, Jupiter, and all those. Uh, if it's irregular, if it's a satellite like our moon, uh, a large asteroid, a colony ship, or even a space station, uh, what their gravity is, and then we go to the biomes. So biomes are like the, just the different types of environmental regions that you might have on your planet. Uh, think of Earth, we've got, you know, water, uh, we've got lots of water, actually, because we're, you know, we're, most of the surface of the Earth is covered in water, but then we also have, like, Arctic, desert, forest, marsh, mountain, plains, uh, urban, all this stuff, and there's even a, a weird biome, which is just, like, you know, uh, kind of, I don't want to say Lovecraftian, but, you know, where the most bizarre, um, you know, creature types or things might be found. So where the laws of nature might not quite apply uh, 100%. Uh, so with the biomes, again, you can also roll uh, randomly. You can roll once or you can roll multiple times. Uh, the thing that I would want to do is probably roll multiple times. And the thing I actually like about this chart is uh, a lot of times where you're rolling on a chart, it'll tell you to ignore duplicate results, but here you don't. Uh, if you roll the same result more than once, it just means that that feature might be more dominant. So, again, Earth, you could say that, you know, the water biome might be, you know, may have been rolled twice on the chart, um, for example. Uh, or if it's a desert planet, you know, maybe you rolled that multiple times and you only, you rolled like, you know, two two deserts, you know, one water, and then you have like one plains or something like that. So you've got basically... A, a desert planet with a you know a relatively small um, you know inland sea or something like that, which is maybe populated. So again, there's all kinds of stuff that you can do with this, and it's it gives you the ability to create dozens upon dozens, if not hundreds of or thousands of different planets, which is awesome. Uh, so once you get the the environments and stuff set up, you also get into your cultural stuff, which I mentioned before, with like what the accord is, how sociable. Uh, the inhabitants may or may not be, what the predominant alignment is of the world. Uh, again, just sort of an abstract, um, you know, you're obviously going to find, you know, lawful good people, even if the planet is predominantly, you know, chaotic evil. Um, but it just sort of gives you an idea of what the, the inhabitants might be like. Uh, and then we've also got like their, their technology levels, their magic levels, and uh, their religious levels. Uh, so another awesome thing about this book, uh, for example, is the fact that it is chock full 
of adventure hooks. So each biome has a chart, a, a D20 chart, uh, for different adventures that you could use with that particular biome. Uh, you also have the same thing, so like every single biome like that has that, including space, including, um, you know, the weird biome, which is awesome. So here's our, here's our weird biome. Uh, let's just read an example of one of the, uh, the weird adventure hooks that you can use. Uh, so with little warning, tectonic plates that have, uh, or sorry, without, with little warning, tectonic plates have taken flight like space-faring manta rays carrying continents on their backs and leaving behind a molten core. Uh, where's this convoy of immense aliens traveling and what is the fate of those stuck on their backs? So again, just an idea of some of the stuff that you come across. But even, again, with the Accord, uh, there's D20 charts for high Accord, medium Accord, and low Accord planets. So there are, you know, like there's dozens upon dozens of uh, of adventure ideas. There's also a leadership system where the player characters could be uh, high ranking or like CEO type individuals within um, an organization, like a business, or uh, maybe they have like a, a guild or something like that. So that's a really cool system to have uh, as well. And again, like I said, we just have all kinds of stuff on, you know, different magic levels, different religious levels, and a ton of uh, adventure hooks for all of those things, which is fantastic. Uh, the last thing that I really want to talk about in this, uh, or the last couple things I want to touch on here, towards the back of the book, we have our sandbox adventures uh, section. So this sort of gives you some different subgenres of science, you know, you can do science fiction, science fantasy, whatever you want to run, but it gives you a few different types that you can sort of look at. So we have like high science fantasy, which is kind of what this, you know, system already sort of is. Uh, you have hard science fiction, which is more based in technology and less based on, you know, magic or things like that. Uh, cyberpunk. And each of these will also reference some related media that you can look up if you want ideas or examples of how to use uh, or how to run, or what kind of adventures you can put in those types of subgenres. Uh, the thing I love, actually, is that Cyberpunk lists Person of Interest, the TV show in there, uh, as an idea, because it was very much based on, like, you know, uh, AI technology. And um, e even though it was set in, like, modern-day real world with stuff that could conceivably already be, you know, available or out there, um, but that's like one of my favorite TV shows. So it's really cool to see that there. Uh, you know, Robocop is an example of, uh, of, of cyberpunk. Uh, so there's all kinds of stuff you can do. There's all kinds of different things, but then we get into our toolbox section and the toolbox again is just charts upon charts. If you're someone who, you know, is sort of a, a long time, uh, gamer, well familiar with like old school RPGs, um, you have a certain fondness, um, potentially either a fondness or aversion to charts. So wherever you fall, you know, that may or may not be a selling point for this book. Uh, but again, we've got encounter ideas for things that you can find within the drift. Uh, so the drift is sort of that like subspace region. Um, it's like a different uh, dimension that you sort of cross over into uh, to travel long distances. So you don't necessarily um, travel through normal space um, in the Starfinder system. You enter the drift and then you sort of you know, you travel for a certain amount of time and then you reemerge into, into normal space. So there's a whole bunch of encounters, again, that you can have here. Just a, an awesome, uh, you know, set of resources to have. NPC toolboxes. So this is always going to be useful. Uh, NPC name and species, their quirks. Um, there's a lot of different quirks that they may have. So you can flesh out their personalities really quickly. Same thing with settlements, uh, settlement quirks, challenges, locations. Uh, that player characters might go to. Uh, we have our starship uh, toolbox as well, so you have a, like a random starship name generator. Uh, again, quirks and then descriptions of several legendary or iconic starships that you can introduce into your campaign. But one of my favorite ones here um, is the treasure toolbox. So this, these are like treasure objects that the player characters can find. They're sort of like, you know, your art objects in like fantasy RPGs where you typically will just, you know, maybe maybe try to describe a couple things that they find, uh, but in very loose terms. <clears throat> so you may say like they find a painting and the painting is worth, you know, um, a thousand gold, right? Uh, or maybe worth 500 gold, um, or you find jewelry that's worth. Um, but those are usually kind of, you know, mundane and they're not the exciting part of the treasure. 
But with the treasure objects, they give you all kinds of examples of things that you can use for um, <clears throat> treasure objects, they call them, uh, of certain uh, value ranges. So for like a thousand credits, for example, you may find a toy starship uh, with five doses of hyperleaf stuffed into the cockpit. Uh, no comment on that. <laughs> uh, Hand-carved wooden figurine portraying a, uh, a, a Yosuke in a gladiatorial costume fighting an unknown quadrupedal predator. So it just gives you some really interesting idea, uh, like things that you can use instead of just, oh, you find, um, you know, you find a, a, a holographic projection of, you know, some journal or something like that that might be worth something, even though it doesn't really have much significance outside of, you know, particular collectors. Um, but there's just all kinds of really cool stuff that you can use here. And I love, I love the creativity. I mean, that's one of the things with Starfinder in general is just the sheer amount of creativity in here. So just having different examples of highly valuable, um, you know, treasure items like art objects, basically for like, you know, that, the, the terminology from older RPGs and giving you like, again, there's just tons of them here, uh, for different ranges. It's just, it's just really really awesome to see. So a lot of great stuff in this book. So that's sort of what's in there. Um, so what are my thoughts on this? Um, this is the exact kind of book that I've been waiting for, for Starfinder. I think I said that at the beginning, uh, but it really holds true here. Uh, I always wanted to run like a science fiction or science fantasy RPG where it's kind of like, you know, the, uh, you know, the planet of the week sort of thing, like kind of like the old school, you know, Star Trek series where they would go from planet to planet, explore, or do stuff. And, you know, it's, I've always wanted to run that kind of campaign. Now it's always been obviously available. It's always been an option, but this book gives you everything that you need to really flesh out and detail those worlds um, without having to spend hours and hours and hours and hours doing it. Um, you can roll randomly on the charts, you can pick and choose as you go, uh, but there's just a ton of resources to create those planets and to have that kind of like, you know, planet of the week style campaign that I'd be interested in running. Uh, but you could also do things like the players could, for example, just be um, scouts for um, a colony uh, ship that's looking to settle on a new planet, like they're trying to escape uh, maybe war, famine, uh, maybe just getting away from uh, the packed worlds or the Vescarium, and they want to create sort of their own little, you know, corner of space. So you can have the players um, in their ship, you know, locate a system, uh, explore the different planets, and try to find one where the colonists might be able to settle. Um, this book also seems very, um, you know, attuned to the, the latest Starfinder Adventure Path, where the player characters are helping colonists on a planet, uh, like on a newly settled planet. So there's a lot of really awesome stuff that you can do with this. Just the amount of uh, adventure ideas, um, the amount of, uh, you know, the amount of, like, just the sheer amount of planets that you can create, uh, the character options that allow you to explore those worlds or interact with those worlds or potentially get off of those worlds if you're marooned there. Uh, it's just really, really fantastic. And it's, you know, it's a campaign setting book where you have to put all the work in but it's so easy to do so uh, with the steps that they have here. Uh, so if you really want to run an exploration-based campaign, or if you want to run a campaign that's just outside of the standard uh, Starfinder regions, uh, then this is an absolutely fantastic book for you. Uh, one of the things I was kind of curious about is how this book would interact with the Deck of Many Worlds, which is one of my favorite accessories, by the way for the Starfinder role-playing game. And truthfully, I think that these two things work pretty well uh, together. Um, the deck just gives you a very, very quick draw version of some of the charts that you have here. So it will give you like technology levels, religious levels. Uh, I wanna say it also gives you even like alignment stuff. So you can do that um, to sort of quickly create the worlds, but then you can go in and look at the biomes. You can look at like what types of environments are there. Uh, so I think that the two do work really well together, um, though you don't necessarily need one to use the other. Um, but they're both definitely worth having, uh, in my opinion. So one of my favorite accessories. And uh, right now, this is probably uh, my favorite Starfinder book. Uh, and the Starfinder books have all been really good. I've really enjoyed all of them. But this is the one that I most wanted because this is the one that will help me uh, create the kind of campaign that I really want to run uh, using the Starfinder system. So if you're looking for exploration, um, you know, if you're looking for easy to um, create sort of like semi-on-the-fly exploration, um, 
this is going to be really, really uh, a useful book for you. Again, tons of encounter ideas, plot hooks, all kinds of things that you could use to build um, long-term campaigns on. And the other thing that I love about this book is, even though it is like your, your vast sort of setting idea book, um, I like the fact that they didn't actually just have a bunch of predefined worlds already in there for you to use. Because, like, logically speaking, if you have, you know, a dozen uh, groups of adventurers traveling out into the vast to explore, um, it's unlikely that they're all going to head in the same direction. So I, I do really, really like that. And overall, I think if you are into Starfinder, this is one of the books that I recommend the most to pick up. Uh, I'm just absolutely loving it so far. And I, I it really, it really got me jazzed to start uh, coming up with some ideas for some Starfinder adventures. So hopefully that's something I can start running in the, uh, the very near future and make some use of the, uh, the deck of many worlds to have built with that as well. Uh, so anyway, let me know in the comments below, what do you guys think of the Galaxy Exploration Manual, if you've been using it at your table? Uh, what are some of the planets that you've created? Uh, what are like, the inhabitants like? What are the different environments? Um, what kind of adventures have you been able to run? Uh, have you been using the plot hooks or not? Uh, let me know all that in the comments below. And if you want to see a page-by-page -page flip through of the book, I will probably have that out um, so this is going to be uploaded on a Saturday. So this the 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 full flip through will probably go out like um, you know Tuesday or Wednesday morning. Uh, but again, really looking for, like really love this book. Highly recommend it. Uh, I think it's one of the best Starfinder books that have come out so far. And again, just the creativity um, in these like the the thing about Starfinder is that it really feels like the reins are off. And the designers can really just come up with whatever off-the-wall concepts they can think of. And it works in this kind of setting. Uh, I mean, the fact that there's a weird biome and it just it, it feels like it makes sense for it to be there. Uh, is just, you know, I guess a testament to the creativity that goes into the Starfinder products. But again, highly recommend it, especially um, if you want to do have more exploration. Uh, if you want to get away from some of the more established areas, this is the book for you. So thank you guys very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed and I will see you all next time. Take care.